Welcome to YWAM Tyler's audio podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope this episode will be fun, interesting, and also beneficial for you. Every episode of this podcast will be different with teachings, interviews, and devotionals. It's about missions, it's about people, and it's about the heart of God. This is an exciting time in which we live, and God is active all over the globe. Youth of the Mission has been partnering with God for the last 50 plus years. YWAMTyler.org. That's the place to go if you want to find out more about us and how you can get involved with God's dreams for His world. Thanks again for tuning in, but let's not wait any longer and dive right into today's episode. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said in verse 7, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But the part I want us to focus on, particularly this morning, is that part where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we're working toward, to see more of heaven come to earth. And so the message topic that I've chosen for this morning uh, that I want to share with us has to do, it's reflecting some on history. And as you know, I've been talking a lot about history because I've challenged everybody saying that I believe there's, uh, uh, your, the effectiveness of one's ministry is gonna be directly proportioned to one's understanding of history and events. And so it's very important for us to get a good grasp of what God has done in the history of, of our uh, Christian walk, the journey that we've had since Christ came to this earth. There's been tremendous stuff that's happened around the globe since he's been here. Uh, so that's why we want to just review and reflect a little bit this morning, meditate on the, uh, how Christianity transforms cultures. It does transform cultures. I'd like to read just a few things from a book that Rick and Karen gave me. It says, in a debate of creation evolution held in our church several years ago, the evolutionist a scientist made the incredible claim that only, uh, that only creation, uh, that creationism was, was not scientific, but the creationists therefore were not scientists. The truth is that creationists gave the world science. Creationists invented science. Without creationists, there wouldn't, would not be science. Here's a list of some of the outstanding Bible-believing scientists who founded the following branches of science, some of whom uh, we're going we're to mention here. Antiseptic surgery, Joseph Lister, born-again Christian. Bacteriology, Louis Pasteur. Calculus, Isaac Newton. Aren't you glad for calculus? How many love Isaac Newton? Celestial Mechanics, Johannes Kepler. Chemistry, Robert Boyle. These were all born-again Christians that came up with these, these inventions of, of these views. Comparative Anatomy, George Cuvier. Computer Science, Charles Babbage. Dimensional Analysis, Lord Raleigh. Dynamics, Isaac Newton again. Electronics, John um Ambrose Fleming. Electrodynamics, James Clerk Maxwell. And, uh, oh, it goes on and on and on. And uh, so I'm not going to list all those, but there's just about several dozen there of scientists that were born-again Christians who gave the world this thing of modern science. And yet today in our modern science studies in most universities and even high schools, they will try to tell us that it all started with a thought of evolution and there was no creation involved. There was no God involved. God is not necessary. And... Uh, what a wild theory they have. Talk about a leap of faith. Except there's a, it's a leap of presumption. 
The ninth one I want to list is the abolition of slavery. Abolition of slavery comes through Christianity. And I'd like to just talk just for a moment here about William Wilberforce. A man born in 1759 in England. A man born with, under tremendous uh, affluence. Well, wealthy family. His father died when Will, William Wilberforce was just a little boy. And his mother was concerned, so she sent him to London to live with an aunt and uncle to be helped and educated some while she was trying to uh, arrange for how to live and so forth. And, but she thought, she decided she made a big mistake because that aunt and uncle had gotten close to John Wesley and become evangel evangelical Christians. And she was not. And so she got concerned, so the next thing she did was bring him back home, but not before he had had exposure to Christianity. And he'd gotten to meet John Newton, the man who had uh, writ, wrote for us Amazing Grace, the man who was a great slave trader himself and in all kinds of debauchery and wickedness and so forth. So William Wilberforce, born 1759, became a very brilliant mind, a brilliant orator, could speak uh, and so much so well that a, a young man named William Pitt, his father was prime minister, but this William Pitt was running for parliament and he asked Wilberforce, would you mind speaking for me in the crowds and help me get elected? Because he, he knew that William Wilberforce was persuasive with his voice. And so William Wilberforce went on the stump and started persuading people and not only William Pitt got voted in, but people said, you need to run for parliament. So at the young age of 21, he became the youngest parliamentarian in England in 1780. And soon after that, because of his Christian uh, concerns and his conscience, the Lord started dealing with him about slavery and slave trade and all these things. So he started working in Parliament trying to get it outlawed, abolished. It took him 27 years, 1807, before Parliament finally voted to abolish slave trade. That didn't mean they were abolishing slave, slavery, but they were abolishing the trading of slaves. It's 1807. So he, he didn't give up because he, he kept seeing the need of abolishing slavery, period. Seeing men brought into liberty and, and freedom, not bondage of slavery. So he kept speaking to the parliament and doing everything he possibly could. And, 30, and, and 26 years later, when he was barely 74, he died three days after Parliament finally voted to abolish slavery. He spent a lifetime, 53 years. Why do I tell you this story this morning, friends? I want to challenge particularly the young people here today that are just starting your mission journey. There's going to be a lot of temptations come to you. There's going to be all kinds of things that will try to sway you. To, to go this way or this way. And I want you to know that things that are worth speaking about are worth staying with. There's an allegation that's made about Christians, accusation that says the trouble with Christians, when we're winning, we give up. When we're losing, we give up. And I'm saying to you today, don't give up. Be like Winston Churchill when he said, never, never, never give up. Stick, stick with it like William Wilberforce. Even if it takes you up to three days before you pass away, you stick with it and you will see God giving the increase, my friends. If God has called you in the missions, and he has. You remember that young man that came to William Booth and says, Sir, I have not had a call to missions. William Booth says, No, you've had the call. You just haven't heard the call. <laughs> We're all called to missions. Can I get an amen out of that one?